Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're glad to see you in the house of the Lord today. Amen. We're hoping a few more will come in. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, please do remember in prayer, um, Sister Lisa and Brother Kevin, both of them are not feeling well. Kevin's had some issues with his eye, and um, Lisa's been having some tiredness and weakness with the heart stuff. So do pray for them this morning. Do remember my dad in prayer. Um, as I shared with the church last night, we're going to um, be having some tests done on Tuesday. Pray that God will just move in that situation. And also, I have an unspoken request that the Lord knows all about. I'm glad to see everyone here today. If you've got a request this morning for prayer, let me know by an uplifted hand. Are there any urgent needs this morning? I see the Opal's not here, so let's pray for her today. Any other requests? Well, not Sister Charlene. Urgent, but my cousin, my, the one who was in the accident, his family, the wife was positive for COVID, which I shared with you guys, but their four-year-old son has also tested positive, so they're having to quarantine everybody in Georgia yes. right now. Her grandparents who came to go get came to get the kids and everything else. So um, yeah. But the four year old is showing symptoms and yes. mom never has. Yeah. Let's remember this this morning. Unspoken anymore. Let's pray. Let's ask God to touch us today. If you feel comfortable, just you don't have to make contact if you don't feel comfortable. Just pray for the person beside of you today. Let's pray for one another. Father, we love you today. We just thank you, God, for everything, Lord. We ask God that you would touch us today. Praying, Lord, that you would have your way, Father, in this house today, Lord. We ask God that you would anoint this time we have together, Lord. And, Lord, may we not take for granted, Lord, the opportunities we have to be in your house. I ask, God, that you will move mightily. We just thank you, Lord, for everything that you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, Lord, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning as... As Sister Janie and praise team comes and leads us in worship today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody glad to be in God's house today. Amen. 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 Thank, thank God that he woke us up this morning. Amen. 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 All right. If you will, stand to your feet and help us sing when we all get to heaven.
Amen. That'll be a good day, won't it? Amen. Amen. Days of Elijah. the Lord. I'd like to welcome those watching online this morning Amen. on Facebook and on all the, on the social media outlets. I've come with a message on my heart today. I hope you will receive something from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17 beginning at the first verse. 1 Kings 17, beginning at the first verse. Now 
Make sure to pay attention to the bulletin this morning. We do have a memo in there from the Pastor's Council concerning this, this rise of this Delta variant stuff. And um, whether whatever perspective you're on, we want to protect our people. So just keep that in mind as you read that this morning. 1 Kings 17 verses 1 through 7. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord of God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain in these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Sheriff that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Sheriff that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass that after a while the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. I want to preach this morning on this thought. Living in the days of Elijah. We just sung about it. Now I want to preach about it. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We just thank You, Lord, for Your many blessings. We ask God that You would touch us today. I pray for those that are here this morning, God, that You would touch them. I pray, God, for those watching online that You would touch them and those that will probably listen to this by CD that don't have internet capability. I pray You touch them. I pray also, Lord, that You would touch, Lord, and minister, God, to those that are sick in body this morning, those that, that are at home, those that are traveling. I pray You would bless each and every one today in the name of Jesus and that every need would be met, Lord. We thank You, God. We praise You and give You glory in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning in the house of the Lord today. We still sing this song called The Days of Elijah. But I have a question this morning. Are we truly living in the days of Elijah? This morning I want to pull practical application from the Word of God based on Elijah's life. We all know that we're in the last days. If you don't believe that, then I don't know what world you're living in. Biblical prophecy is being fulfilled on every hand. We are indeed seeing the falling away and as conditions continue to worsen in the world. But at the same time, we are reminded that the worse this world gets, the closer we get to the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Right. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. So I want us to look at how we are living in the days of Elijah this morning and see what we can glean from the Word of God. First of all, we are living in the days of Elijah because we serve a God who provides for His people. Amen. In verses 2 and 3, of, this, of our text this morning, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook, Sheriff, that is before Jordan. Here a judgment of God came on Ahab and Jezebel. We'll cover them in a few minutes. And so, with no water, Elijah needed the provision of God to get him through his situation. And we understand this morning that part of the attribute of God is that He does provide for His people. We know Him to, as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Hallelujah. In Genesis 22, 13 and 14 it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up 
for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said in the day the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. But you see, a lot of times people, when you talk about provision, they limit it to money. They limit it to fortune and fame. They limit it to, to things. But you see, God provides more than just things. Yes, He provides for our practical needs according to Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But He also, friend, provides protection. In Psalm 5, verse 12, For Thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. Wilt Thou compass him as with a shield? We read in Psalm 91, verses 1-3, through 3, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He provides for every need according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According to His divine power, He hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So here's Elijah here in verses 2 and 3 following the command of the Lord and going to the brook Sheriff. That is before Jordan according to verse 5. It says in verse 6, And the ravens brought bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook. Sometimes when God that meets our provision, He will do it with unusual sources. Amen. 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 Here it was ravens. It could be, if you have a need of some kind this morning, it may come through unusual means, but God will see you through. And He will take care of your situation today. Hallelujah. And so we get past the brook because guess what? It dries up. Mm -hmm. Then Elijah goes to this place called Zarephath. And he sees this widow and her son. And he's fixing up and she's fixing up sticks and things for them because they feel like they're going to die. Mm -hmm. Because verse 12 in 1 Kings 17 says, And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do that thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after that make, thee, make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she did what according to St. Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel mill was wasted not, neither did the cruise of old fail according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. Here, the widow was about ready to give up. But notice what happens in this story. They use something called meal. Which in the Hebrew means flour. Flour is white and it's a purifier. What are you saying, Pastor? For us today, God has provided purity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, that your sins be as scarlet, 
They shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 53, 5, But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. Hallelujah! We read in Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to His riches of His grace. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. Meal, flour, symbolic. Purity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus this morning? We may be living in the days of Elijah per se in today's times, but can I tell you, we still have the blood of Jesus. The blood will never lose its power. The blood will never lose its power. Hallelujah. It reaches to the highest mountains. It flows to the lowest valley. Hallelujah. But then they have something called in this story a cruise of oil. In Hebrew it means a crushed olive oil. The same type of oil they used to anoint kings and, and, and people in the Old Testament. Oil is symbolic, we know, of the Holy Spirit's anointing. Psalm 92 verse 10 says, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of the unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And then Isaiah 61 3, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them the beauty for ashes, the oil joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that He may be glorified. James 5.14 in the New Testament relates to us today. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying in this time we're living in, in this perilous time we're living in, church, we have, we have God meeting our needs through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But there's another reason why I believe we're living in the days of Elijah is because we're living in a desperate need for the fire to fall again. In 1 Kings 18, 38 through 40, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice in the wood and the stones in the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. And they took the prophets of Baal, and Elijah took them and kissed them and slew them there. We all know the story here. The prophets of Baal were having a showdown with Elijah. Now let me take you on a journey here this morning. What's the... One religion in today's times that opposes Christianity more than anything. Islam. Islam. Islam holds Ishmael as the son of promise. The Ishmaelites are the ones in the Old Testament that introduced Baal worship. The connection begins to be made when the consensus is shown that the Mecca God, which was Hubal, is also translated in Hebrew, Baal. Take a look at the following observations. The great God of Mecca, according to scholars, was named Hubal. At the time of Muhammad, the Kaaba was officially dedicated to the God Hubal, a deity who had been imported into Arabia from the Nabitans, which is now in what is now Jordan. But the preeminence of the shrine, as well as the common belief in Mecca, seem to suggest that it may be dedicated originally to Allah, 
the high god of the Arabs. Pre-Islamic Arabia also had the stone deities. They were stone statues of shapeless volcanic or meteorotic stones found in the deserts and believed to have been sent by the astral deities. The most prominent deities were Hubal, the male god of the Kaaba, and three sister goddesses, Alat, Alamat, and Auza, Muhammad's tribe, the Karash, thought that these three goddesses were the daughter of Allah. Hubal was the chief god of the Kaaba among 360 other deities. He was a man-like stature whose body was made of precious red stone and arms of solid gold. Hubal was known as the moon god. In the same place of worship as Hubal in Mecca is now where Allah is worshipped. So what happened then is Allah replaced Hubal, making them one and the same. And this is where Islam gets the crescent moon from. So then how do we derive that Hubal and Baal are one and the same? If Hubal's name in Hebrew means Baal, check this out. Numbers 25.3 and Israel joined himself unto Belpor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Hosea 9.10 I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first stripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Belpor and separated themselves unto that shame. And the abominations were according as they loved. Deuteronomy 4.23 Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Belpor. For all the men that follow Belpar, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Joshua twenty two seven. In the iniquity of poor for us for too look too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, and there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord. Psalm one oh six, twenty eight and twenty nine. They they joined themselves unto Belpar and did eat sacrifices of the dead. They provoked them to anger with their inventions. The plague broke and upon them. Baal was mentioned in was worshipped in Moab according to Psalm 83 verse 6. It was the god of fertility thus brought from Moab to Arabia which the name became Hubal. So I did all that to say this. According to the Bible, the Ishmaelites were not worshipping God. Their alliance with nations that worshipped Baal suggests that they were also worshippers of Baal. Both Muslim and non-Muslim sources state that Hubal was recognized as the chief presiding deity of the Kaaba. Muhammad's grandfather worshipped Hubal and even prayed to Allah while facing Hubal's idol. The Muslim sources claim that Hubal was brought to Mecca from Syria due to the influence of the Moabites and the Amalekites. The nations worshipped Baal, which demonstrates Hubal was actually the Arabic form of Hebrew of, of Habel or the Baal. So here we are, Elijah challenging these false prophets to Baal. Goes and builds, they go and have a showdown. He says, How long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. If Baal be Baal, follow him. And they build altars. The, the, Baal, the Baal worshippers built an altar, they were calling out to God, cutting themselves trying to get their God to act, and He didn't act. That gets done. Elijah prays a simple prayer, builds the altar to the Lord, the fire of the Lord falls and consumes the sacrifice. And they bow down and say, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So then, just as the fire fell then, we need the fire to fall now. This was prophesied by John the Baptist in Matthew 3 11, I indeed baptize you with water and peace, but he that cometh to me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And we know this happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. We need to realize that our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Hebrew 12.29 For our God is a consuming fire. And the fire today represents times of refreshing from 
the Lord. Acts 3, 19, 20, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached to you. So we see here a foreshadow of the fire. And we need the fire to fall. Because we're living in the last days, the days of Elijah. We're living in the days of Elijah because of politicism and secularism. We get to 1 Kings 19, 1-3-3, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And we found how he slain the prophets with sword, and Jezebel sent messengers unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. And when he said he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. In today's times, we have the attitude in this world of those like Ahab and Jezebel. Now when you hear Jezebel preached in a lot of churches, everybody wants to use that in legalistic terms and try to say people, women are Jezebels because they, they, dress, they, they dress a certain way, go a certain way and all that. That's not what this is talking about here. What you have here is two evil rulers, Ahab and Jezebel. You have two things happening here in this verse. Ahab is bringing about a secularism to society. Jezebel is bringing a politicism and humanism to society. And these two are converging on each other here trying to keep Israel from recognizing who the true God really is. In today's times, we see this going on. And we were told about this. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful and holy without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, needy, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. We then realize in Matthew 24, 6 through 12, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be killed, to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow wax cold. Today we know that this is being perpetrated by the enemy of our soul, the devil. Now I want you to realize something this morning. The people in this building are not your enemy. The person sent beside you, behind you, in front of you, not your enemy. The enemy that you have this morning is someone called the devil. And what he wants to do is he wants to divide and conquer the body of Christ. Amen. He wants us to argue. He wants us to tear down instead of build up. Amen. Now I want you to know this morning where this is coming from. It's coming from something called the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. First John 2, 18, little children, this is the last time you heard that the Antichrist shall come. And even now there are many antichrists whereby we know is the last time. First John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist where we heard it should come and is now already in the world. Notice I said the spirit of antichrist, not the antichrist. 
There is a world leader that is known as the Antichrist that's going to rise up according to the book of Revelation. But you see, you've always got to have a forerunner for it to happen. And we're in the forerunner right now. We're in something called the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24. You don't believe me? Look at what's going on. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Nations fighting within nations. Kingdoms fighting within kingdoms. We're seeing it worldwide. And it amazes me, and I'm going to say this this morning, it amazes me how our perception of biblical prophecy is limited to just the United States of America. Because biblical prophecy is something that's going on all around the world. We get so, we get so focused on, on American Christianity, we forget about that it's worldwide Christianity. Amen? So, guess what? We're in the days of Elijah. And in these days, we need to hear the still, small voice of God. We get to verse 11 through 13. And he goes into a cave. And God starts speaking to him. We get to verse 11. It says, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And there was a great strong wind that rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks. But the Lord, before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in an earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in fire. After that, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice in him and said, What dost thou doest here, Elijah? So that still small voice speaks. It is a challenge. For us Pentecostals to just let the still small voice speak. Amen. We, we get so caught up in the emotion. Mm -hmm. We get so caught up in the shouting and the and the fire and 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 revival and and outpouring and that's all good and it has its place. But what tends to happen is when all that's gone. We're all back like we once were. When we need to just listen to the still small voice of God. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But there's one more thing I want you to notice in this story this morning about Elijah. Elijah went up, but we're going up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Elijah went up, but we're going up. 2 Kings 2.11 And when it came to pass, they went on and taught that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both of son and Elijah went up in the whirlwind to heaven. One day, we're going up. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And the wait for us some from heaven, and we raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But until then, we must keep doing what the Lord has called us to do. Amen. Do you want to know how significant this is this morning? Matthew 17, 1 through 5, it says, And after six days, taking Peter and James and John his brother and bring him up to a high mountain apart and was transfigured for them, and his face did shine as sun, and the raiment was white as light. That's Jesus in his glorified state appearing to the center three. And behold, there appeared unto them who? Moses? And Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for three, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed him, a voice stood out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, whom I well please, hear him. 
This whole story of Elijah is a foreshadow of the end times and how it's going to play out. Note here, Elijah being here with the glorified Jesus. This is symbolic of the return of Jesus Christ on earth. And one day He's coming back in His resurrected state. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16, we read, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean. Now of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress in the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, hallelujah. He's coming for the church. And then he's coming back to earth to defeat the enemy once and for all. I am thankful for that this morning. I'm thankful for the victory we have through Jesus Christ. And I hope that you gain victory today over whatever you may be going through or facing. Let's pray together. Father, we love You. And Lord, we just glorify Your name. We thank You, Lord, for this time we have together today. I ask, dear God, that Lord, You would just touch us like You did Elijah. Lord, we pray, God, that our provisions would be met, all provisions met, we pray, God, that You would guide and direct us with Your still, small voice. And we pray, God, that we would be ready when You come for us, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, for those watching, God, online, on Facebook, Lord, that are listening to this message. I pray, God, that they will receive something from this and that, Lord, they would find a place of salvation if they're not saved. And ask You into their heart to be Lord of their life, confess their sins to You, and live for You until You come again. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that You would touch those watching His needs, bring healing to them. I pray for those in our own congregation, Lord, that You would touch and meet every need in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank You, God, and we praise You, and we give You glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord.